Welcome back to the Vintage Sewing Machine Garage, everyone. I wanted to make a video today to talk to you all about um, the tendency that some people have to pass by sewing machines because they judge the looks of the machine by the cover and not what's really going on. Uh, anytime you buy a vintage sewing machine, unless it has been overhauled uh, and you can verify that, it really is something that you know, sometimes you take a chance. You do this when you get these on a bid site or at a yard sale. Someone's selling their mother or grandmother's machine. They don't know anything about it. Uh, and so I wanted to kind of talk about this today. And remember that if you if someone doesn't want much for a machine, you might be willing to take a chance on it. Because as I have discovered, there are times when a machine might be missing something or it might be broke, but very often it has just gone unmaintenanced for a long time. And as I often like to say, you never ever want to uh, plug a machine in and just try to get it going. Uh, the moment you get it home, you really need to kind of assess it. So what are you looking at? You are looking at an early, I'm going to guess, <clears throat> early 1960s Japanese made class 15 sewing machine. These are often referred to as clones. The first clones were straight stitchers, and the class 15 refers to an engineering specification that was created by the Singer Sewing Machine Company. And uh, many companies in Japan copied this design when the patent expired, and they, they, they did some wonderful things with it. Uh, one of the things that will tell you you're dealing with a Japanese made machine is that it will say it will often say as this little tag does precision built deluxe sewing machine um, it's just kind of funny that it says sewing machine on it even though the people who bought it knew what it was and I wanted to kind of you know this is a machine I got I'm trying to remember where I found it <clears throat> you currently see this thing sitting in a carry case this is an old Singer carry case it holds the standard, uh, the Singer standard had, had several sizes over the years. One that existed for a very long time was the one you see here. And of course it is, if we just measure the machine, it is 14, it's usually 14, this one is 14 and a half, it could be 14 and three quarter. Uh, you often found Singer machines in that size. Later on, when they did their slantomatic designs with the 301 and, of course, the 400, 500 series, they went to a longer design. I think it's 16 and a half or 17 or something like that. It's not in my head at the moment. Anyway, the point is, um, you might be wondering, well, why would a Japanese machine fit into a Singer carry case platform? Well, it's, it's when you realize the power that Singer had in the marketplace back in the day, Anyone who wanted to get into the sewing machine business was going to have to convince someone to, to buy this new machine and replace something like a Singer with it. And in order to make that happen, um, they had to convince people to buy the machine. Machines were expensive. Japanese made machines were cheaper, but still, um, people were not interested generally in having to repurchase a sewing table or even repurchase uh, anything to put their sewing machine in because those were expensive too. And so uh, European manufacturers, even you know, Bernina did this, uh, Pfaff Company did this out of Germany, <coughs> the Necky uh, Sewing Company out of Italy, and the Japanese did it too. They thought, well, it's either Singer or White. Those were the two biggest holders of sewing machine market share. And so they would simply create a platform or the bed of the machine uh, in the same dimension and size as Singer's, so that they would be compatible with Singer cabinets. And that was a very clever move. There was nothing illegal about it, and it helped, you know, it helped make the sale. So if someone said, gee, I don't know, I have a Singer table, the salesperson could say, oh, but that's okay. This is size to fit in Singer tables, not a problem. And this is how many of these machines were, were, were sold to people who had been formerly loyal to Singer or, or, or maybe the white brand and with their own dimensions. Now, I'm not going to be using this platform for this machine. It didn't come with a case or a table, and that's, that's okay. I, it can be used um, on a tabletop. I'd like to find something for it. It uses the uh, very commonly used dual block 
um, uh, power cord setup that most of these machines came with. And let's see, I have one somewhere. And it looks like this. You can get new versions of this. This one I have in my hand. Uh, I believe this is what came with this machine. I think this machine was in a table because I have, what you're looking at is a speed controller and it's about the same size as a foot pedal, but, a, but it was installed in the table and it is used as a knee control. And um, again, this will not, this setup will not fit into this uh, carry case platform. If I were gonna to try to make this work, I would need a foot pedal and the block would have to come over into a section. Many of these cases were had like a little compartment. I was two inches, three inches or something on the right. And that's where I typically install these. If the, uh, the blocks were originally stalled in carry cases from Japanese companies um, for things like foot pedals, but uh, this machine did not come in this case. And that's why I can't use this case because I do need the space for that, for that. I think it's called a cord block I just showed you. Anyway, that's not the issue. What I wanted to show you all today was the fact that I bought this machine. Uh, and if you look closely at it, you know, you get it home. It's like, well, it doesn't look in too bad a shape. Doesn't seem all that scratched up. There are a few spots here on the paint. But uh, as I'm checking it out, I realize, oh, these knobs are very stiff. Sometimes, like this one here, it's too stiff and I'm stopping. And as I've mentioned before, never ever force something like this. It's one thing if it's a little slow, but this thing is not. And if I force it, uh, I can damage it. it. It's perfectly fine to use um, once it's been overhauled, right? Because this machine has likely sat for at least 15 years or more. And I'm just basing that on all the machines I've seen before and, and how stiff they are. Uh, I would not be surprised if this, oh, that, that button went down. That's nice. This is the adjustment for the feed dog height where you could do darning. And, and I think it might need some uh, extra adjustment because the fact that it moves at all is a surprise. The bobbin winder uh, device, it pushes in a nice click and then I pull it up, has good spring tension. I suspect it's going to work just fine. However, it doesn't turn, it's very stiff to turn. I suspect it hasn't been used in a long time. The original bobbin tire, which you can see is a green color. Uh, and if I zoom in here, you, you folks will watch me as I take it off. It's probably not gonna, it might even break. I can tell it's, uh, it's got some dry rot. It's probably, because of the green color, it's probably original. And if we take it like this, you can see when you stretch it, you see the cracking. The rubber's tired and it needs to be replaced. I'll replace it with a generic black ring. Um, usually these took one of the Singer sizes. Now you might think, well, why is it this color green and this body, the body of the machine is more like a sage avocado color. And for that matter, if I turn it, you will see that the bracket for the machine and the motor itself, need to pull back a little bit here, is yet another shade of green. This was done very often because uh, I'm looking to see if I can see where the motor was constructed. Um, I, I haven't inspected it far enough to know. But typically, uh, in the early part of the 1950s, when Japanese machines were being imported into North America, the, the electricals were made here, and then the head of the machine was created in Japan, and then they would upfit them when they got um, uh, stateside or even in Canada. And you know, they, they would tell them, give us a light muted green color, and they might send a sample and they might or might not be successful. You often see this off color thing. It's not a defect. It was the best they could do. Today, uh, we have color standards around the world to help companies get colors to be um, matched up. Uh, and it's not even perfect even today, but back in these days it wasn't, but that's not an issue. Uh, if you look more closely, we'll zoom in. And I noticed that when I turn the hand wheel, Let's see if I can get a little focus here. When I try to turn the handle, it's very stiff. There can be many reasons for that. Do you guys see this here? 
Uh, fortunately, I can see it. Sometimes it's embedded down. It's embedded down below, and you can't even see it. But clearly, thread broke off and got caught around the shaft of the motor. That could be a serious drag. That's all got to come out. The uh, belt is not original. They would have used either a green belt or a white belt or a black belt. Uh, it would have been the, the traditional rubber sewing belt. This has been replaced at some point. Uh, I will keep this belt. Um, I don't see any cracks in it. So it's it may have been a higher quality one and it may not be that old. If it does have cracks, I replace it. If not, I leave it because um, it's still a good strong belt. And of course we have the two cords. One is for the motor and one is for the light. And you can see there's <laughs> the little string that used to hold a tag. It would have said, in this case, motor. I know the black cord is the motor because it's coming out of the housing of the motor. The white cord is for the light, the light in the machine. Uh, what else to say? I get the machine and I'm thinking, uh-oh, I don't see a bobbin plate. The plate, of course, that you would need uh, that goes here. I thought, well, do I have to hunt for one? So I was looking at the machine and before I purchased it, or before I paid for it, I, it came with this box. And I thought, oh, okay, that's a greased or greased uh, buttonhole holer. Um, never assume that the attachments that come with the vintage machine you buy work with it. This might, I don't know for sure. Um, Greist made a lot of these things for Singer, but they made them for other companies as well. And what do you know, inside this box was the plate. And I'm very pleased to, to report that the tension clip is, looks to be in perfect shape. People would often go, maybe not the original owner, but some person who had it later, maybe a grandchild or someone, or maybe just a neighbor, who knows, somebody that was given to or sold to, they went to change the thread and this flopped off and they couldn't figure out how to get it back on and they just left it. And what do we have? We have two vintage class 15 bobbins. That's the sound of them falling on the floor. Um, if, you, uh, if you get vintage bobbins, as long as they're not bent or warped, those are wonderful. Not hard to find, but it's nice. I'm, I'm happy those are there. Uh, sometimes you get lots of surprises. This is a feed dog cover that was designed for early singers that did not have a way to drop the feed dogs. And so when people wanted to darn or free motion work, they would cover them with this so that the feed dogs would not cause movement of the fabric. This, this does not work on this machine, to my knowledge, and you don't need it because you have feed dog drop with the darning uh, adjustment. So again, be careful if you're new to hold sewing machines, never assume that everything with the machine was meant for it. The original sewer, somebody said, hey, I've got something to a sewing machine. Could you use it? Oh, sure, thanks. And they would just put it in their box and you know, worry about it later. You know, they didn't look a gift horse in the mouth. Nothing wrong with this. It's a beautiful piece. It just doesn't go with this machine. This would go with, um, uh, I'm pretty sure it goes with Singers, maybe a few other brands, but not this one. And it would be for a much older machine. But, you know, I always hold on to these because you never know when you might need that. What was really nice to find was this, the original manual. Now, some of you have, have on the channel have said, hey, I've got one of these Japanese machines and I don't have a manual. <coughs> the, remember that the manufacturers of these machines were making them private label for lots of companies that sold them. And so it's not surprising. Notice that even though the machine has the name Imperial on it, An Imperial would have been either, uh, it could have been a house brand of a retail machine. It could have been a sewing machine distributor. Um, and it even has a coat of arms. Many of these did to make them, you know, give them some, some, uh, some panache, some try to, to, to give them uh, anything that would, would remind people that these were, these were as good as Western brands, right? You don't see the name of the Japanese company on it. You would later see that companies like Janome and others. But anyway, notice that the manual doesn't say Imperial. In fact, when you open it, it says, it just starts with instructions. You know, it doesn't say, thank you for buying the Imperial. It doesn't because they would use this same um, instruction manual, you know, maybe change the color or something that would have been easier to do. You even have a tools list, which is nice. Um, and on the back, it's just got a graphic. And they did this because they would use this same document. They would print this for other 
brands or brands labels I should say right it's 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 a concept called badge engineering it it's something that a lot of companies who make a lot of different products use anyway that is nice to have if you don't have one of these if you can ever find a manual on eBay Etsy Bonanza other places look at the machine and it may not be the same brand as yours but what if it has similar if you see anything that looks similar maybe it's the shape maybe it's the maybe it's the um, uh, a certain you know maybe it's the tension assembly there are cues that will tell you it was made by the same company and that manual might be good enough right what's the old saying uh, perfect is the enemy of good enough if it's close enough to help you get the machine threaded and used then it then it's okay so Again, when this says <laughs> there's no name on this, that was on purpose. It, they didn't forget to print the name. They did this intentionally. So this machine, uh, what else I, can I show you that might be something that would concern you if you were just, let's lower the camera, if you were just finding this, maybe you're trying to poke around and inspect it. Let me get the flashlight in here. So we have our bobbin case, which is hanging at the moment. And the race cover, this big ring here, is, um, let's see if I can turn this heavy beast. Oh. If you look here, you'll see one of the bolts, yeah, one of the bolts to this cover is intact. This one's hanging. It's not broken. People often look at machines like this and they assume that, oh, no, it's broken. Now, if something is missing, that can be an issue because then you have to hunt for it before you can get your machine to work. In this case... It's just hanging. Uh, either someone was poking around with it. It wasn't me. I haven't poked around with this machine yet. Um, but if we uh, try to pull this little pin over here, these are um, these are uh, pins that help lock the machine in place. And I, I don't even know if this is currently lined up. So anyway, I'm not worried because this is not broken. It's just not attached, right? And I need to take it all out anyway to clean it and inspect it. So, when you first look at this, you think, oh, man, no wonder they want to get rid of this machine. It doesn't work. It doesn't work yet, but it's not necessarily broken. Somebody has fiddled with it. Somebody has maybe left it sitting for years, and it's a machine. It likes to run, and when they don't run and they sit, um, it's not good for them. But it is uh, a nice two-tone color scheme, and it has zigzag. So somebody paid extra. They could have got the straight stitch version of this, but they chose zigzag. Anyway, I'll be making more videos on this as I start digging into it. But this is not uncommon. In fact, someone can say, well, the machine worked the last time we used it, <laughs> but you don't know when that was. Well, Grandma said it was fine, and she did 30 years ago. So I'm not suggesting you shouldn't buy this. In fact, you may be able to get this machine for very little money, and the the... The robust quality of the engineering on the inside of the machine can be fantastic. So uh, stay tuned, everyone. Let's see what it turns out. Let's see if uh, you know my taking a chance on this turns out well. And then once I get it running, presumably, fingers crossed, then uh, then I'll find a client for it. Somebody who maybe wants a vintage sewing machine. They want something that is going to be strong for them, but they don't want to pay the price of uh, some of the more... Um, uh, highly sought after vintage machines that can bring hundreds and hundreds of dollars. I've sold some of those and I have some of those. But I often tell people, uh, I, I often worry that people take machines like this and they just get rid of them because they, oh, that's a, that's a piece of junk. I want a Singer or I want a, a Neki or a Foth. Those are all great machines. But remember, the Japanese were really good at copying some of the great designs from other sewing machines. So we'll talk more about the machine later. But I I mainly wanted all of you to see this because it's not unusual to come across a machine and end up with a layer of dust like that and it's stiff it's not running it's actually running a little little more for, for whatever reason but um, uh, the bobbin case is not in, in uh, installed another reason not to plug a machine in right away and turn it on if you haven't inspected the machine you haven't made sure the bobbin case is the bobbin case is just hanging over here right now. We just saw that. If I just plug it in and say, hey, let's see if it runs, I could snap a needle. I could damage the bobbin case. Uh, you can actually harm the machine, not just because of trying to move dials that have been sitting for 20 years. 
you know, I'm going to be taking the lid off and I'm going to be going inside and cleaning and lubricating and waking up those wonderful steel components that are behind all of these dials. And once I do that, the dial should uh, be happy and they will be happy to move for me. So I've got a nice tension spring over here. Uh, presume, I, I like the, uh, the, the bright red numbers there on the, on the uh, uh, tension assembly. So again, waste not, want not. These are great machines. Um, they don't always get appreciated. Uh, there are a number of brands I've talked about that don't get appreciated and don't bring super high prices. Um, this machine will bring a higher price than I paid for it because I'm going to spend hours and hours going through it, going through it and waking it up from its long hibernation so that it can sew for someone and be a good piece of equipment for them once again. Thanks for watching everyone. I try to make videos that uh, I try to imagine some of you out there, particularly those of you who are new, when you're looking for machines and you come across something like this, you might like, oh, I don't even know what that brand is. Maybe I can't get bobbins for it. Yes, you can. They're Singer Class 15 bobbins. You can get them all day long. Uh, what about needles? Classic home sewing needles. The same home sewing needles that work in all sewing machines, almost all sewing machines in the vintage era, as well as modern machines. So uh, lots of good stuff here. You do not have to pay a fortune for a vintage sewing machine. And, you know, if you want to take a chance and inspect it, I, I don't know if this machine's going to run. I, I still haven't gone through it yet. So it could be there's something big missing here that it won't function. But um, sometimes you just take a chance and someone says, hey, I'll make you a deal on this machine. I, I don't want to deal with it or I'm taking it to the dump. And, uh, you know, it's, it's really hard for me to to pass on anything that I think people are going to throw away because they, they just don't know. They, they really don't realize it or they don't have the time or patience. Maybe they just, you know, it's not their thing. But I was glad that, uh, I, again, I've had this for a while. I can't even remember. I got it in the fall. I don't even remember um, where I got it, to be honest. Now it's, it's a blur. But we're going to see what we can do with it. And I'm, like I can say, I try hard. In, in, I, sh I know I show a lot of fancy, valuable machines on my channel at times. But I also like to, to give some respect to some of these machines, the ones that people often overlook, because you know you may be bypassing a wonderful sewing machine that can last you know generations more, and be a, a great machine for you. And, and if, unless you're a collector and you really are collecting some of the more higher price machines, you may not you may not need those. So anyway, thanks for watching, and we will see you all in the next video.